Thanks, Tom. Uh, it has been really fun to be here and to see lots of lots of old friends and uh, this is uh, in, in many respects a dream come true being here uh, because uh, a lot of us have been talking about seeing a project like this come to fruition at some point and uh, and, and it's really here so that's exciting and I, I need to say um, thanks to Tom for all the really hard work that's been done. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And not just what you see here in these last few days, but over the last year plus uh, in getting all this lined up. And uh, to Jeffrey as well for all of his help on logistics. <laughs> and, uh, and to David Dockery, who's not here, I think. But you know, coming uh, in as the new president uh, when this project was really just at the end of its uh, I mean, ready to go forward for funding and being willing to take a risk on something that's, you know, potentially controversial when you're starting off in a new role. That's, that takes guts, and, uh, and I appreciate his willingness to do that. And I'll, let me just close by the, these uh, introductory remarks here by thanking Chris and John. So um, uh, Chris and John are my colleagues at the John Templeton Foundation. They're the head of the, uh, John's the head of the philosophy and theology program and uh, Chris Stewart's um, Vice President of the Temple and Religion Trust. And these guys have also worked really hard in making this all happen over uh, many years leading up to this point. So I just want to say I'm grateful for the work that you guys do, and I, um, I'm really glad to work at a place where you guys can be my colleagues. So. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. None of that counts towards my time, by the way. Uh, <laughs> All right, so in a way, the, um, uh, this, this talk has two parts, and the first part really is continuous with some of the comments that were made by Brad at the end of the last session and uh, some, some comments that Lydia made. But we didn't plan it this way. It's just Providence that it worked out like this. Um, so um, let me see if this thing is working. Oh, we've got to do this first. There we go. All right. So the year is 1245, sometime between Easter and Midsummer, and the place is a country road somewhere between Cologne and Paris in France. And along this road are walking two Dominican friars uh, who've been dispatched on a mission to the University of Paris by the general chapter of the Dominican Order. So at this, at this time, mid-13th century, University of Paris, it is the leading educational institution in the Christian world. It's the Harvard of the 13th century. Uh, and students from across Europe, that's the place they want to go. They flock to Paris to learn from the brightest minds of the age. But like all academic centers of excellence, it seems, bright minds wanted to push boundaries and challenge orthodoxies. And one historian describes the situation at Paris like this. Uh, the very importance of the university to which uh, professors and students flocked from all parts of the world became the occasion of many disorders. For where there were so many gathered together, Fired with ambition and enjoying the privileges which were lavished on teachers and students, it was but natural for youth to become relaxed and for the professors to become haughty, ambitious, and anxious to acquire a great name by upsetting old theories and introducing new doctrine. So some things never change, uh, you might say. <clears throat> so at this point, Paris, still a relatively young university, had uh, actually graduated a number of high-ranking members of the um, European society, including Pope Innocent III. Uh, and because of its stature, it was actually granted all sorts of special powers and authority. So the King of France, for example, conferred upon the university the authority to, um, uh, to arrest uh, students and faculty. Only the, only, the civil, only the ecclesiastical authorities could do this. Uh, the civil authorities were not allowed to touch students and faculty at the university. And so, actually, other important similarities to things going on uh, in our days. Um, and because of this, again, more similarities to students tended to run wild in Paris. And uh, this was exacerbated by the fact that they enrolled young, usually 13 or 14, and um, their education would con continue for six to 12 years. So, again, more things that are like today. I have two in grad school, so there you go. Um, but the Domin Dominican order was keenly aware of the importance and power of the, of the university because they realized that the future church leadership would be trained there or would pass through there. And um, 
if, the, if they couldn't uh, maintain a sense of order and orthodoxy, uh, that would be a major setback for the church in the long run. Uh, but there was trouble, and of course the trouble was the explanation for why our two Dominican friars were on the road there. So what was the, what was the trouble? Um, well, there are actually a lot of them, but the one I'm going to point to for the purposes of this talk um, concerns the influence of Islam. So 300 years before this, the, uh, the Umayyad dynasty roars across the Straits of Gibraltar onto the continent of Europe, marching towards France, and um, it threatened to topple all of Christian Europe at the time. Now things began to come unglued uh, politically, and at this point, at 1245, the threat, uh, the political threat from the, um, from the caliphate had subsided. But the declining influence of Muslim political powers corresponded with the rise in the power of Islamic ideas in this period. So less than 50 years earlier, in 1198, you have Averroes um, completing what many regarded as the most potent um, articulation and apologetic defense of Islam in the Western world. And in these, in these works, uh, Averroes argued that the philosophical framework of Aristotle, it was Aristotle's framework, combined with the sacred teachings of Islam, uh, provided a comprehensive and persuasive account of nature, theology, and philosophy. Uh, had those ideas remained within the Iberian Peninsula, no one would have been concerned. But in fact, in the 12th and 13th century, what you see is Latin translations of Averroes and of the patron philosopher of Islam, Aristotle, flooding over the border and making their way uh, into the hands of Parisian intellectual elites. Uh, and this was worrisome. Uh, first of all, they worried because perhaps it might turn out that people found the reasoning of, Ar of Aries and Aristotle persuasive and converted to Islam. Uh, <clears throat> but even if you weren't worried about conversions to Islam, there were reasons to worry because the philosophical system on which Averroes bases his thought, the work of Aristotle, seem to entail heterodox theological conclusions. So there are many of these, but here's just an example, a sample, for those of you who know something about this, um, for Aristotle and Averroes, uh, arguably. Uh, at the time, it was believed, at least, um, that it precluded the possibility of individual immortality, uh, that the universe is eternal, uh, that God can't know particulars, can't know particular individuals or particular facts about individuals which seem to threaten omniscience and providence and lots of other things. Um, so those were, those were concerns. Even if people didn't become uh, Muslim, the fact is if they were to internalize the Aristotelian system and draw these theological conclusions, that was a problem. And some Islamic thinkers worried about this as well. I mean, Ghazali, who uh, wasn't reacting to Averroes because that would get the chronology wrong, but understanding that the implications of the Aristotelian view for theology um, raised concerns about this in his uh, book, The Incoherence of the Philosophers. Um, Averroes, not persuaded and seeking to defend himself against uh, Ghazali, writes his book, The Incoherence of the Incoherence, and so it continues with the um, philosophers fighting this out. But even with, um, you know, even Averroes recognized that there were problematic conclusions that were entailed by Aristotle's philosophy. And you might say, in the face of that, he throws up his intellectual hands and endorses something that later becomes known as the two truth theory, uh, according to which some claims are true theologically and some philosophically. So in other words, Averroes recognized the heterodox nature of some of the conclusions, the theological conclusions that followed from Aristotle's views, but since they seem to follow from undeniable first principles, it was hard to see how you could just throw them away. So you have to keep both, even though they contradict each other. You might call this the 14th century version of Noma, right? Uh, I'll come back and say that again later. Um, <clears throat> so not, not a few Muslims were unsatisfied with this solution because it seemed to imply that sound reasoning from the evidence of nature and the senses leads to one conclusion, whereas the evidence of the scriptural texts lead to another. Uh, and a lot of Muslims rebelled against that notion as well. So with Averroistic works gaining in popularity, um, the risk that Christian thinkers would endorse something like this heterodox two-truth theory was, was real and troubling. And um, so they worried about this uh, conversion to Aristotelian rationalism. Um, so what was the solution? Well, one solution was to just to try to prevent the spread of, of, of Aristotle. And in 1210, an assembly of bishops at the cathedral at Sens issues this condemnation of the works of Aristotle, which included a ban on his works at Paris, and it reads in parts as follows, neither the books of Aristotle on natural philosophy or their commentaries are to be read at Paris in public or secret, and this we forbid under penalty of excommunication. 
Now, you can probably imagine that didn't work out too well, right? I mean, the fastest way to get the students to read a book is to say, now, the, 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 the administration really didn't want me to put this book on the syllabus, OK? And then the next day, they've all read it. Um, I tried that with Michael Behe's book, uh, first time I taught a science and religion course. And they really did read it the first week, because I told them that the, my colleagues didn't want them to read the book. Um, <clears throat> but I digress. So. Um, Interestingly, other universities tried to capitalize on the fact that there was the ban at Paris by advertising that the students could come to hear the books of Aristotle, which are forbidden <laughs> in Paris. So even marketing, right, is going on uh, in those days. Um, so who are, who are our two friars on the road to Paris? They are um, Albert the Great and his 20-year-old brilliant star, Thomas Aquinas. Um, so the path that Thomas follows to get to this point in his life, if you don't know anything about his life, is actually interesting and it's worth a short digression. So Thomas was born into a pretty wealthy Italian family. Um, these are the ruins of the castle of the, the family home in Roccasecca. Uh, he was the youngest of eight children, five brothers, all of whom were ended up in military service. Uh, his mother was a countess, mid-level Italian nobility, um, saw her son was very brilliant. And at age five, they sent him off to the monastery at Monte Cassino, which, where his uncle was the abbot. <clears throat> and he remained there for nine years, so he's 14. And so like most of the students I mentioned, 13 to 16 is when they're, 13 to 14 is when they're going to university. He ends up going off to the University of Naples. And uh, during his time there, he was just brilliant. Outperformed every student in every field in which he studied. He was clearly the head of the class. Could have done anything he wanted, any career of his choosing. And of course, you know, like mothers today, probably wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer. In any case, um, <clears throat> that's not what he decided to do. He really felt a deep sense of calling to use his intellectual brilliance in the service of Christ in the church. <clears throat> and um, he was closely associated with the Dominicans at that point. So at age 17, he agrees to join the order. And mom is not happy. <clears throat> so there's very few paintings, actually, that have pictures that portray uh, the mother of St. Thomas. Uh, that's her in the middle, in the back of this one uh, painting. She, she's outraged, so she immediately leaves the castle, heads to Naples, the Dominicans get word that she's on the way. Under cloak of darkness, literally, uh, they, they shuttle uh, Thomas off to Rome. She shows up, they say, well, he's not here. And um, she didn't believe it, actually. She persisted in trying to find him, while, but then realized that, um, that he really was gone. So she goes back home, brings her five sons, who are now members of the military, uh, back, and says, find him and bring him back here. So they consult with the military intelligence of the day, uh, learn where he is, storm into his room, capture him, bring him back to the castle, and he stays there for two years under house arrest. And uh, during that time, his, his family tries to persuade him to leave the Dominican order to no avail, and his mother decides it's time for the last ditch effort. Right? So she goes and finds the most attractive prostitute um, in the region <clears throat> and instructs her that she's to seduce Thomas to get him to give up his vow of uh, chastity. So this is a very famous you know, incident in the life of St. Thomas is portrayed in many paintings. Uh, here's one of them. Um, you know, during this time, he's, uh, he's continuing his study every day of scripture and secular authors from morning to night. And so one evening, he's getting to the end of the day, the fire in his chamber is burning low. He retires to bed. His mother issues the prostitute in. And minutes later, out she comes running out the door with Thomas chasing her with the fiery poker, uh, <clears throat> and uh, she decides she's not taking this job. Uh, <clears throat> and Thomas returns to his room, according to, this is what he tells later in his life anyway, and he takes, and this is a, one of the 17th century paintings that portrays it, he takes the hot poker and he inscribes a cross on the wall, which you can see on the right-hand side of the painting, maybe, maybe in defiance of his mother, who knows, <clears throat> and uh, drops to his knees and recommits himself to a life of poverty and chastity and learning. So you might think, well, that's sort of a critical, we like to have these critical juncture stories in the lives of people, and you might think that is one, but it really isn't. He had already committed himself to this life of scholarship and teaching and poverty. So again, things haven't really changed. <laughs> um, but unlike many of his peers in Paris, he didn't see um, theology or the academic life as an intellectual game. It was... Uh, a spiritual mission to love God with his mind and to train the church to do so as well. That's the way he conceived of his own, own mission. So it was not about independence or self-interest. 
Um, it was about using his talents for the glory of God. So that brings us back to the road. Well, I guess, um, so you might wonder what, uh, what happens. Actually, he ends up being, uh, his sisters help him to escape. They actually lower him out of a window. Uh, the Dominican friars are waiting there. They end up ushering him off to Cologne, which is where he does his, uh, undertakes his study with Albert the Great. Um, but here we are at 1245, and they have a 325 mile walk to Paris, and no one knows what they talked about, of course, but you can imagine they were strategizing about how to reverse the unorthodox trends of thought that had been gaining momentum at Paris. What, what would they do about that? Um, you know, the books of Aristotle had been banned, but they were being read and they were being taught. It wasn't just in secret. And, um, you know, the easiest route to restoring orthodoxy would have been to try to get the university to return to the roots of Plato, the platonically inspired theology of St. Augustine. Um, that would have been the easy way, but that's not what happened. So what did he do? He sets out to teach Aristotle. Uh, and it wasn't a tactic. Uh, it was, Tom, Thomas thought he could see what the Muslims and the heretics could see, namely that Aristotle provided a powerful system of thought that seemed to get many of the facts right, had impressive explanatory power, and provided scaffolding for developing deep theological insight. That's what he thought he saw there. Uh, but of course, he needed to show that the objections didn't hold, and that in fact these fertile theological insights really were embedded within this philosophical system. And so, he writes his four volume Summa Contra Gentiles, which is really an apologetic work aimed at pushing back against the, uh, the, the claims that have been defended by many of his uh, uh, Islamic um, uh, opponents. Uh, he writes his magnum opus, or I guess he never quite actually finishes it, but uh, his fully articulated uh, systematic Christian theology grounded in Aristotelian metaphysics and epistemology. Uh, so what's, what's the final result? I don't know if you, um, I had a picture of Averroes back there a little bit, and um, it, I, it actually drew from this painting. So there are many versions of this painting. This one's called The Triumph of St. Thomas. Um, and you can, in, in, the, in these paintings, St. Thomas always sits in the middle um, holding his uh, writings or scripture. And underneath, if you look right underneath, you can't see because it's really small. But that's the picture of Averroes I showed you earlier, uh, right? The triumph over Averroes. Um, so you might think, well, that's the end of the story. He comes in, shows everybody the way forward. Uh, that's it. Uh, but it didn't work out that way. I mean, even in his own lifetime, right? His views were not... Uh, popular, and shortly after his death, at the urging of the Pope, there's another condemnation of certain theological th uh, theses, and many of those theses, uh, historians argue about this point, but many of the theses seem to be, if not teachings of Aquinas, very close to things that he had to say. So it looks like it didn't work out so well in the end, but of course over time, the, the opposition really was, was short-lived. The condemnations were later lifted, and you see these intellectual shifts that St. Thomas precipitated becoming instrumental in bringing about major future developments, including, I would say, the scientific revolution. And if you want to fight about that, we can do that during Q&A. Um, but why am I telling you this story at the close of the second day of this uh, conference? And of course, it's not too hard to guess, right? The church today faces a lot of challenges that the church faced then, political, moral, financial, doctrinal, missional. Um, as in the 13th century, students run wild, faculty push the boundaries of orthodoxy, educational institutions are still detaining students for their crimes. Um, but the key intellectual challenge that's the parallel to the challenge they faced then isn't Islam and Aristotle, it's um, Darwinism, evolution, and naturalism. That's the, uh, that seems to be the, the troublesome worldview. So Darwinism, so why the parallel? Because Darwinism provides the intellectual scaffolding for the ideological archenemy, or maybe it's, maybe it's naturalism. Right? But, it, but new atheism ha takes as its philosophical starting point um, Darwinism. So as in the 13th century, Christians who confront Darwinism, if they're not converted to atheism, seem to be driven towards heterodox conclusions, right? just the same way that Christians engaging Aristotle in the 13th century were. Um, and as with Averroes, some are trying to promote theological schizophrenia by recommending some version of the two truth theory. Um, so what do, we, what do we do about that? Um, 
well, maybe it's time to do something like what, what Aquinas did and, and begin to engage the view and ask if those things really follow. Now, when I, when I put together this talk for the first time, um, I, and I read through this, I thought, this is, this is terrible. You, you, you do not want to give this talk because every heretic who wants to push an idea in the church could give this talk, right? Um, everyone thought this was the idea that would lead to the unfolding of, or the, the uh, unraveling of orthodoxy, but you know, we see everything all turns out well in the end. Um, so just uh, be patient and go ahead and begin to think through this. Uh, but you've got, I've got to give you more than that, right? I've got to give you some reason to think that, in fact, there are resources for pushing back against the theological objections, right? That it really doesn't lead to these um, heterodox conclusions. And furthermore, I think I also owe you some reason to think that it does provide fertile ground for theological reflection, that there really is something that's theologically of value there that should uh, invite us to look more uh, carefully at it. So in the last 15 minutes or so, I'm going to try to do that. And this is going to go by really quick. So uh, I thought there was going to be a Q&A so I could get away with saying anything. But now I realize I'm going to have to answer for some of this. So OK, that's fine. But I guess I'll start off by saying as a parallel to uh, Aristotle in the 13th century, what, uh, what I think some people are seeing is an analog to what Thomas thought he saw in Aristotle, that evolution is a powerful theoretical framework that seems to get the facts right, that has impressive explanatory power, and provide scaffolding for developing deep theological insights. And unfortunately, we don't, haven't, haven't spent a lot of time talking about, I mean, the church generally hasn't spent a lot of time talking about the third bullet. We're more worried about pushing back against the, the problems than we are asking, does it provide a scaffolding for something interesting? So I'm gonna do a little of each. Um, I'm gonna start with the challenges, and uh, I have four up here. The one I didn't put up, and I feel bad about this because of some of the conversation is, does it, in, does it raise problems for providence because it looks like evolution is intrinsically chancy or random? I think that is not a challenge at all, but um, that's something we can talk about in Q&A if you want. So here are four, four challenges. Um, that it, that uh, adopting evolution means affirming deism or denying God's role in the creation of humanity or denying the historical Adam or affirming the existence of a creation that's driven by nature red and tooth and claw. So those are four good Good challenges, and we've heard actually all of these emerge in one way or another in the course of the discussion. So let's go quickly through actually just the first, well, the first three, and maybe a little of four. Then I'll skip ahead. Um, so affirming deism does evolution entail, or at least uh, make more likely, the deistic picture where God creates the world and then is hands off? Uh, the answer to that question is no. Uh, evolution does fit comfortably with the idea that God's aims for biological processes unfolds according to natural laws by natural processes that God created to govern the cosmos. But God uses processes unfolding via natural laws in meteorology, and no one thinks the weatherman's pushing deism, right? So the view that God typically carries out his ends in the cosmos this way is still consistent with God sustaining the world in existence displaying an imminent presence in it, miraculously intervening in it, and even miraculously creating new species and irreducibly complex structures if you go in for that sort of thing. There's nothing about the basic Darwinian story that requires that you rule any of those things out. If you rule those out, you rule them out on other grounds because you like methodological naturalism or whatever. But it's not a requirement of the view that you do that. So I think that's important to put on the table. What about denying God's role in the creation of humanity? Um, does evolution deny that? And the answer again is no. Um, if, it, if it weren't for distinctively theological commitments, I think we have to admit that it could be that evolutionary processes operating in ordinary ways yield homo sapiens and we wouldn't have any problem with that, right? In the same way we might not have problems with evolution leading to the uh, uh, emergence of rabbits or lichens. Um, but nothing about, so I just wrote this part out because I think it's important to not just hear but see. And again, th you know, these things are controversial, I th um, so they're worth discussing. But nothing about evolutionary theory, so I say, requires that we remove God from these processes. It's perfectly compatible with evolution that God created evolutionary processes, provided them with a teleological directionality, sustains those processes in existence, intervenes to cause specific events that are critical to unfolding uh, of the tree of life manipulates the genomes of the ancestors of Adam and Eve, 
there's nothing about the story that requires that God not act in that way. Uh, so I think that's not a concern. Evolution does not deny God's role in the creation of humanity. All right, what about historical Adam? Well, uh, this one's tricky. You know, you've heard people talk about the evidence and you've, you maybe have heard conflicting signals about this, right? So what, what is the state of things? And the answer is, uh, it's controversial. So it does look like the genetic evidence we have right now indicates that there was some group of a few thousand, a few hundred to a few thousand homo sapiens in Africa around 150,000 years ago, and that we trace our ancestry back to that group. But, and this is the part that some people might regard as controversial, and again, I'm happy to pick up on this in the Q&A, um, but that evidence doesn't yet show that we can't also trace our ancestry to a pair of individuals in that group. Okay? It does show that we will also trace our ancestry to other members of that group. I don't know if that's clear, but you can be descended from two and then have other descendants that you interbreed with from other members of that group farther down the line. Okay? But it can still be the case that you trace your ancestry to just a pair in that group. Now, some people deny that. I think they're wrong. I think there's a logical fallacy in the reasoning that leads people to that other conclusion. And I will say this. There are some uncomfortable entailments of the view that I just described, which I'll tell you about in Q&A if you want to talk about it. So anyway, I think the worries about historical Adam from a biological point of view are just premature. Uh, we can't think that that rules out whatever you think you need in order to affirm the existence of an original pair um, who use their morally significant freedom to sin in virtue of which original sin emerges and is transmitted to the progeny, which includes all of us. So I say. All right. Um, then the last is affirming the existence of a creation that's driven by nature, red in tooth and claw. And I have a lot of slides about this, but I'm going to skip through them for the most part because I think Jeff addressed a lot of this in his um, presentation, and I don't want to, there's not a lot to add to that. But I, I will say a couple of things. Um, actually, let me skip past that and that. Um, so, there's, I, I put that in terms of one question, but it, there are actually a number of different sub-questions. So let me show you what I think some of the questions are. Why does God permit animals to experience pain and suffering? How can we explain the reality of animal pain and suffering if it's not a consequence of the fall? Is animal pain and suffering an intrinsic feature of an evolving creation? What goods come from permitting the animal suffering we find in evolution, which could justify God's permission of it? Okay, I'm just going to say something quick about the first two and then forget the others, but I'll move past a lot of slides with cute animal pictures that I won't talk about. So on the first one, why does God permit animals to experience pain and suffering? Jeff said this before, but I just want to repeat it, that this question isn't distinctive of the position of evolutionary creation. Whether you're a young earth creationist or an ID person or any other person, this is a problem and it needs a separate solution from the resources of theodicy, whatever that might be, but it's not distinctive of this view, so we can just pass, pass by that. Second is, how can we explain the reality of animal pain and suffering if it's not a consequence of the fall? Um, so the presumption behind the question is something like this. On the young earth creationist view, you have a sense of what causes the suffering, right? The fall of Adam. But since on the evolutionary view, lots and lots of that suffering goes on before any humans are around, then we need some other explanation. But the first thing to say about that is that the fall isn't a great explanation to begin with. Jeff gestured in the direction of this during his talk, but um, remember the, the goal is to give, the goal in theodicy is to give a morally sufficient reason for God to permit some evil to occur. An explanation where permitting that evil is necessary for bringing about an outweighing good, okay? So the question is how do things fare with that along those lines with the fall account? Um, so what, what's the outweighing good? So most people will say, well, it's free will. God gave Adam and Eve free will. It's in virtue of their using their free will to sin that then these bad things happened, right? So the greater good that's being preserved is Adam and Eve being able to exercise their free will. Um, okay, but here's the thing. The undefended assumption here is that um, there was some reason why God created the cosmos in a way that was fragile in this regard. Um, why would God have made a world with creatures fragile in that way. And what do I mean by that? I mean, in such a way that the moral wrongdoing of an individual or a pair can have these catastrophic consequences for the rest of nature that radiate out over time and space for millions and billions of innocent creatures. That's a weird way to create the world. 
Now, it could be that God has some reason for that, but it's hard to imagine what that is. It's hard to imagine what the greater good is that comes from bringing about a creation that's fragile in that way. And until we have some explanation for that, I just don't find the, the fall explanation persuasive, even if there's a young earth. Okay, so I'm gonna skip through um, these because we have no time for that, um, but I'll come back to it if you want. Um, all right, so let's talk about the theological insights part. So that's pushing back against some of the criticisms. Um, a lot to talk about there. Does it provide any fertile scaffolding for theological reasoning? So it's interesting. I mean, this is, uh, this is my historian side. Um, it seems to me if you look at the history of Christian reflection about the notions of providence, there are two different kinds of things that go on. There's some discussion about providence over free created agents. Um, we think about election and things like that. And then there's concerns about God's providential control over the rest of everything else. Natural providence, I call it. And what you see, so I say, is in the, in the history of Christian thought, when there are major developments that take place in the sciences, there's a spike in interest in talking about natural providence. So three, um, three periods in particular, 17th century with the mechanistic revolution, late 19th century with Darwin, and especially the early 20th century with Einstein. Uh, big spike in interest. All right, so um, during the mechanical revolution, what you see, and this is the period that's my own area of academic expertise, um, I work on Leibniz, um, you see Christians proposing these models of natural providence where God orchestrates the conditions in creation to achieve his ends through these law-governed um, displays of creaturely powers. Right? That's the way it works. So that cl the clockwork universe that you see, you know, Boyle, for example, talking about when he likens the creation to the clocks in Strasbourg, and where things perform their function upon particular occasions by virtue of the general and prim primitive contrivance of the whole engine. That's the last sentence there. I won't read the whole thing because it's too long. But this idea of the clockwork universe, where God is seen as the, uh, as the consummate engineer or architect, right? that's the model that becomes predominant as people think about uh, providence. And it's not a concession. Right? It's not they're conceding to something. They think that's a, that's a uh, um, that, that's a way of affirming the, the, the greatness and the glory of God. Uh, you see something similar happening in the late 19th century. And um, until recently, um, there really wasn't a lot of scholarship, I think, on the Christian reaction to Darwin in the 19th century. There was some, but there's a, there's a lot of good work to be done there. And here's, um, this is actually a sequence of slides. I'm just giving you one of them here from, it's a, from a sermon by Henry Ward Beecher, who's arguably the most famous preacher of the late 19th century in the US. And um, so he's reflecting on the difference between design being embedded in nature because of a direct act of an agent, as opposed to design being embedded in nature because it's produced by a machine making machine. Okay, so here's the, here's the quote. He's talking about making rugs. And of course, this is in the context of the Industrial Revolution, creating machinery that automates the production of material goods. So, well, he says, and this is a very sexist quote, I'm, I apologize. Um, well, that, that's a beautiful design, and these are skillful women that made it. There can be no question about that. But now behold the power loom, where not simply a rug with long drudging work by hand is being created, but where the machine is creating carpet in endless lengths. Now the question is, is it an evidence of design in these women that they turn out such work? Implicit answer is yes. And is it not evidence of a higher design in the man Okay, who turned out that machine? I apologize for Beecher on that. Um, which could carry on this work a thousandfold more magnificently than human fingers did. Okay, just leave the sexist part out for a minute. The, the, you see the insight behind this, right? This is the, a, a more magnificent way for God to manage natural providence, not to do all these things individually and directly, but by do it, to do it by creating the machine-making machine. That's what Darwinism does um, on Beecher's way of looking at things. Okay, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip over this slide. Um, so, so in one sense, what, what Darwin does is provides you with a kind of theology of nature, right? That's what Beecher is claiming. It provides you with a theology of nature for understanding God's providential relation to the natural world. Um, but I think there's some more, there's some, some other interesting types of insights that we find. And I'm just gonna give two examples, evolutionary convergence, which has been gestured at in other uh, talks and evolutionary psychology of, of religion. So these are just two quick examples. Um, 
So convergence is the phenomenon by which unrelated or largely unrelated organisms evolve similar traits like body plans and coloration and organs. And uh, discovery of um, convergence was somewhat surprising because these um, traits are sometimes very complicated. I mean, eyes are complicated. And so Charles Hodge, you know, pushes back against Darwin because he can't imagine how the eye could evolve. And what we, what we now know, or believe if the evolutionary story is right, is that it has evolved a number of times. So you see it in squid, and you see it in an octopus, and you see it in us. Um, it looks like there are patterns in evolution that lead certain traits to continue to emerge, uh, even though they're developing in very different lines. So you see that with winged flight, with mammals and reptiles and birds. You see it in patterns of coloration in organisms that develop in very, very different parts of the world, right? So there's not common ancestry there, um, but nonetheless, they're converging on the same traits. So who cares? I mean, why is that interesting theologically? Um, for some Christians, evolutionary convergence is a lens through which we see God's teleological aims for creation. So um, what you might think is that this is evidence that God has put guardrails in place in the natural world to point evolution in particular direction, to point it at things. So we see that it does point at some things, coloration patterns, body shape, differential coloration, neutral buoyancy for these critters. Um, but that raises this question, has God configured the natural environments so that they lead down specific paths towards specific things that help to realize God's purposes? If one of God's aims for the biological world is to produce creatures that are made in the divine, d divine image, are there ways that he structured things to point the process of evolution in that direction? Um, a direction that makes the emergence of intelligent, moral, religious organisms inevitable. Um, is there something like biological fine-tuning in nature? And if so, does that manifest the creativity and the majesty and the glory of God in ways that we formerly didn't look for or appreciate or even imagine? Like we couldn't imagine that. Now, I think what's interesting is those questions are worth pursuing only if you are a Christian or a theist who's engaging the biological evidence. A naturalist isn't going to think about guardrails being put in place to point the direction of evolution in particular directions. But it might also be the case that it would have been much more likely for you to think of this hypothesis if you're approaching your science and biology as a Christian. If you believe that God created the world with the goal of having organisms that manifest the divine image that starts off in the primordial soup, you're gonna start looking around for things that pointed in a particular direction, right? So, so your theological convictions can be brought to the science in a way that produces potentially fruitful hypotheses. They won't always be right, right? But this is a case where your, your Christian theology might really have inspired you to look at certain scientific questions. Okay, um, so here's the second, another topic that I think lots of people have become interested in in the last few years, evolutionary psychology of religion. So here's one of the amazing things. Around the world, across times and culture, people are religious. There's like no atheist culture, at least none that have emerged until very recently. So why, why is that? Why is religion everywhere? And um, so one, one answer might be, because there's a spiritual dimension to reality and everybody experiences it, right? It's like saying, why does everybody believe in, believe in water? Well, because everybody sees water around and that's why, they, so maybe, they, maybe that's the reason. But people, religious people across different times and cultures don't often explain their views that way. They don't say, I'm just, I, I, I see, I experience directly this uh, religious dimension to reality. So it looks like we've got to, Explain in some other way. How does this religious belief continue to emerge in a recurrent way when it seems to outstrip any data that we have for making inferences to it? Um, so this has led some people to infer or to hypothesize that, that our minds have evolved, have evolved to have natural dispositions to belief in God or other types of supernatural agents. And there's some suggestive evidence that in fact this might be true. Um, if you look at evolutionary theories of the origin of, of religion, there's a whole bunch of them. There's a variety of different hypotheses that are being floated, but one of them is that um, belief in invisible agents, gods, who care about human behavior evolved as a way of promoting cooperation, uh, especially as human group size grew. Right? It's another mechanism for sustaining cooperation and um, thwarting defection, uh, which has adaptive advantages when you're operating in the context of a group as a social organism. So in other words, um, you'll get what's coming to you because God's in control. 
We've evolved to believe that there are divine beings or supernatural agents that care about our behavior in a moralizing way. And in fact, there's some, mm, if you know about this research, please uh, give me a little uh, grace here, because um, this is all contentious stuff. But uh, there's some really interesting suggestive evidence that when you prime people with religious concepts, um, regardless of whether they're atheists or not, they tend to behave in more cooperative ways. So if you know there's a common type of um, experiment that's used in psychological context called the dictator game, I won't tell you all the details, but the, the basic part of the story is there's one person who's got 10 bucks and the other person has none and they have to decide how much they're gonna share. And there are all sorts of variants to this. But in one of the really interesting experiments, when they primed people with religious concepts, they had to unscramble sentences that had either religious words in them or not before they went into the experimental setting, the degree of cooperation went up significantly when they were primed, whether they were atheists or not. So that's weird. It shows something about the way we're wired, that these concepts trigger certain kinds of behaviors that look like they have adaptive value. So perhaps religion is an evolved tendency of our of our human brains. Okay, who cares? Why is that theologically interesting? Well, here's one reason. I mean, a lot of new atheists think that this sort of work debunks religious belief, right? That instead of morality being fobbed off on us uh, by our genes, religion is. But I think Christians can see that in a, in a very different way. So when we look at Romans 1, I think most or a lot of evangelicals at least interpret this in the following way, that God's provided evidence or data in the world from which we can generate arguments and inferences to the existence of uh, of the creator. That's how we know about the eternal power and divine nature. It's clearly seen because there's data and then we do natural theology on it. But this gives you a different way to actually think about that passage because maybe it's not that there's data that leads to arguments. It's rather that God is plain and clearly seen because he's allowed us to evolve natural dispositions to believe in him that have to be resisted to be denied. You have to actively resist those tendencies if you want to be an atheist. Okay, so some say we talk about the Galileo moment, you know, we have the Galileo moment when it comes to evolution. And I, I actually don't, I agree with others that that's not a helpful way to think about where we are. Uh, Jamie Smith wrote a piece in uh, Christianity Today, uh, so a couple years ago now. And here's a passage from it. I'm only going to read the second paragraph. First, he says, using the phrase Galileo moment, cast the scientists as heroes and martyrs, willing to embrace progress and enlightenment. Second, as a result, this framing of the debate depicts those concerned with preserving Christian orthodoxy as backward, timid, and fundamentalist with heads in flat earth sand. Any who voice hesitation or skepticism about the assured, obvious implications of evolutionary evidence are cast in the villainous role of Galileo's putative persecutor, Cardinal Bellarmine. I think that's right. So we need a different, we need a different framing, you know, for just for sociological reasons. So maybe what we need is the Thomas moment. And I like it because... In the one hand, it sort of gestures towards the skepticism of the apostle Thomas, um, who needed to put his hand in the wounded side of the risen Christ in order to believe. Um, but a Thomas moment isn't one where the backwards church is brought reluctantly to embrace an empirical challenge to faith. That's not what it's about. It's about the church aiming to bring every thought captive to Christ by showing itself and the world that the faith can be articulated through a, a lens that others think entails atheism or, or heterodoxy. I think that's the parallel with Aquinas. So what I hope, and here I should just say, I should have given you a disclaimer at the beginning. I am not speaking as the senior vice president at the John Templeton Foundation. I'm just speaking to you as Michael Murray, fellow Christian thinker. Um, what I hope we'll see is not the proliferation of parishes where evolution is put only in the service of new, new atheism or heterodoxy, but a generation of Christian colleges and seminaries and churches where they're urged to think about hard questions and the consequences if theistic creation is true. And if you're skeptical, I would say just engage the questions purely hypothetically. What would it mean if this were true? What would it mean if this were true? Does such a view open new theological vistas in the way I've suggested? Uh, I'm just glad to see that Ted's is pressing down the road towards Paris, as it were, and I hope that um, we can all applaud the work that they're doing in that aspiration. Thanks.